In October of 1993, Straight Crossing entered into an agreement with the Government of Canada to finance, design, build, own and operate the Northumberland Strait Bridge. Immediately, Straight Crossing began the mammoth undertaking of designing and constructing one of the world's longest continuous multi-span bridges. A bridge that is safe and will endure the severe weather conditions of the Northumberland Strait. A project that addresses each and every environmental concern. That must maintain a strict schedule to complete the bridge in three and a half years. And a consortium that finances, designs, constructs, assuming the risks for the costs and completion of the project and will operate the bridge for 35 years. The Northumberland Strait Bridge consists of two inshore approach bridges and one main bridge. In total, the 11 meter wide precast post-tension concrete bridge that joins Prince Edward Island and mainland New Brunswick will be 13 kilometers long. The two approach bridges are approximately 1800 meters in length and the main bridge 11 kilometers long. Straight Crossing has put environmental concerns at the forefront of this major construction project. Design and construction methods were developed in consideration of the unique terrestrial and marine environment surrounding the project site. In 1994, the staging facilities were open for the production of bridge components and their construction began. <laughs> By the summer of 1995, Straight Crossing employed over 2,000 people to bring the construction sites to full capacity. Subcontractors employed an additional 500 men and women. Of these 2,500 people, more than 96% came from the Atlantic Canada region. One of the um, key things that this project has done, I believe, for looking for you know, what has it done for the future, is uh, those people that it employed that are very young or early in their careers, be the engineers or, or, or tradesmen, doesn't matter, but the people that are very early in their working life, I, I think it has implanted in them uh, uh, an understanding that, that everything is possible. It's a great experience, yeah. I think there are a lot of dedicated people, yeah, here working on the bridge and having all the same goal to try to achieve that by the 1st of June this bridge is going to be operational. The way people are dedicated to the job and um, because I think they, they really feel that they, they are part of it. Components for the approach bridges were produced at the New Brunswick staging facility in Bayfield. The components consist of precast concrete and were transported by land or water to the bridge site and assembled in place by a twin launching truss with a traveling gantry crane. At the Prince Edward Island staging facility in borden Carlton, the main bridge components, pier bases, pier shafts, main girders, and drop-in girders have been produced. The main bridge components consist of precast concrete in steel forms. Over the course of the project, it is estimated more than 425,000 cubic meters of concrete have been poured, more than 50,000 tons of reinforcing steel placed, and more than 12,000 tons of post-tensioning cables installed. The concrete for the main bridge components is produced at the staging facility's concrete batch plant at an astounding rate. On average, the batch plant produces 1,500 cubic meters of concrete a day. All bridge concrete is tested at an on-site testing lab to ensure the material meets all of Straight Crossing's quality control requirements. In each of the four assembly line fashion component production areas, high tensile post-tensioning tendons and bars have been used to strengthen the completed components. Each pier base is designed and produced for a specific location in the strait to suit the water depth at its final position. Each base may vary in height and mass, with the largest pier base weighing close to 5,200 tons and measuring 42 meters in height. Typically, pier shafts, which weigh up to 4,000 tons each, suit the nominal bridge height of 40 meters off the water. However, 
About 20% of the shafts differ in height due to variations in the roadway profile grade at the navigation span and PEI approach. Fabrication of the drop-in girders differs from the pier shafts and bases because it uses a forming system which allows the entire girder to be cast without construction joints. Drop-in girders measure up to 60 meters in length. A typical drop-in girder weighs approximately 1,200 tons. The main bridge girders are the single largest component used in the construction of the bridge. Each girder is about 190 meters long and weighs up to 7,500 tons. The Prince Edward Island staging facility is equipped with a slider track system for transferring these huge bridge components. This concrete and steel system enables workers to move the enormous concrete components efficiently from one stage of construction to another. With the help of a sledge, a 240-ton large capacity transport unit, the huge components are moved along the various stages of production, into storage for curing, and finally onto the marine jetty for loadout by the heavy lift vessel Swan. Thursday, July 13, 1995. The Swanon, a one-of-a-kind floating crane, arrived off the coast of Prince Edward Island. During the following 18 months, the Swanon will place a total of 175 main bridge components, loading them from the jetty, transporting them to the bridge site, and placing each component in its position by utilizing the differential global positioning system. However, before the Swanon can place the bridge components, each pier site must be excavated by the 420-foot Betty L. crane barge. The Betty L. is then used to install concrete hard points at the pier site to create a horizontally level tripod for supporting the pier base after installation. Once the hard points have been placed, the pier base is transported to the bridge site, set in place, then concreted to the ocean bottom. The first pier base was placed in the Northumberland Strait by the Swannon on August 7th. Later that month, on August 21st, the first pier shaft was placed in the Northumberland Strait. Following the placement of a pier shaft, a template is placed on top of the pier and grouted. The template is match cast with the bottom of the main girder and is used to facilitate its precise positioning. The first of the 44 main bridge girders was installed on October 1st. The girder is placed on top of the previously positioned template. Post-tensioning tendons are installed through the girder the pier shaft and the pier base. When stressed, they form one complete unit. The first drop-in girder was placed on November 17th. A drop-in girder is erected between two adjacent main girders. Closure joints are then cast and post-tensioning tendons are installed and stressed running the length of the span between the pier segments of the adjacent piers. The Swan and crew continued working to place as many components as possible before the winter winds began to blow and the ice formed in the strait. In mid-December, the Swannon and six other strait crossing vessels were moved to Georgetown for the winter. In its first full construction season, strait crossing successfully completed the Prince Edward Island approach bridge, placed 24 main bridge components in the strait, completed the piers for the New Brunswick Approach Bridge and maintained the project master schedule. During the winter months, work continued at the staging facilities in New Brunswick and Prince Edward Island. The early months of 1996 also presented the main bridge ice shields with their first test in an Atlantic Canadian winter. The ice shields caused the impacting straight ice to break up by forcing it to ride up the side of the cone and crumble back. The ice shields are also designed to prevent an ice buildup, ensuring there is no delayed ice out in the strait. During the winter of 1995-96, that technology was proven. On March 23rd and 24th, Strait Crossing invited the public to come aboard the HLV Swan. The response was overwhelming. Just to see how big this thing really is. <laughs> it's pretty huge, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's enormous. Big. Just such a big... Big, big, big thing. <laughs> More than 6,000 men, women and children from across Atlantic Canada and from around the world 
keen to see this enormous vessel close up. Thanks to a mild spring, the Swannon returned to her duties on the Northumberland Strait less than a month later on April 16th. The crew on board had been busy over the course of the winter, maintaining and servicing the heavy lift vessel, making sure she was ready to tackle the busy season ahead. I think we, we succeeded in, in getting sufficient storage of components during the winter time and I must say a lot of appreciation for the people, yeah, of the craft people, especially outside, working on such difficult circumstances, yeah, about 15, 20 degrees below zero. With 24 components placed the year before, there remained 151 components to erect before winter returned again. The ongoing common challenge was, was uh, getting people to uh, to believe that it's that it's possible, and and that challenge uh, went from the very beginning right through until um, I'm going to say probably April this year. And I think that's when all of a sudden the pendulum started swinging, and then uh, then everybody just got on to saying, "Hey, it is possible, and we can get to the New Brunswick abutment." before the snow flies. There were already 12 pier shafts, 11 pier bases, nine main girders, and five drop-in girders completed and ready to be placed. And another 12 pier bases, six pier shafts, 15 main girders, and 11 drop-in girders in production. In New Brunswick, after spending the winter producing approach bridge segments, crews began to place the components with the same launching truss that had completed the PEI approach bridge the season before. As each week passed and construction continued, the principles and concepts behind the construction of the Northumberland Strait Bridge were proven. They want to know how it is all the pieces go together. How do they actually, how do you tie them together? Is it is it like Lego? We've, we've seen the cartoons. Yeah. Is it like that? And, you know, in, in, uh, in the big picture, it's, it's not that much different. One of the most important structural elements is one most people will never see. This literally brings together the pier bases, pier shafts, and girders using a construction technique to create one continuous unit from all these individual components and is called post-tensioning. Prior to pouring the concrete, Hollow PT ducts are placed within the reinforcing steel forms and tied down. Once the concrete has cured, the components are post-tensioned with high tensile strength steel tendons, which have been threaded through the ducts. Throughout the length of the bridge superstructure, post-tensioning is used to pre-stress or pre-compress the structure, which reduces or eliminates undesirable tensile stresses that would otherwise cause the concrete to crack. This same technology is used to tie the many smaller segments on the PEI and New Brunswick approaches into one continuous structure. By the end of construction, over 10 million lineal meters of post-tensioning steel will be placed in the structure. On August 3rd, Straight Crossing reached an important milestone, the placement of P-22, the navigation span, which marked the halfway point of the bridge. The span which is 60 meters off the water, has a maximum clearance of 55 meters in height. The piers are 250 meters apart and offer a ship's clearance of 172 meters in width. The navigation span is designed to accommodate the largest ships that travel the strait. There will also be navigation lights on each side of the piers to light up the channel for ships, as well as a radar warning system. Bridge construction will also include 25,820 lineal meters of barrier wall. This wall has a base width of 500 millimeters, a top width of 225 millimeters, and an overall height of 1,100 millimeters above the top of the riding surface. It is detailed to wrap around the edge of the bridge, not only for aesthetic reasons, but to protect the crucial transverse post-tensioning anchors. Very durable 45 megapascal concrete is used to construct the bridge's barrier wall. Slip forming is a continuous extrusion process where fresh concrete is placed into the top of a horizontally moving form which vibrates, compacts, and then shapes the concrete into the barrier formation. The barrier is strengthened by a reinforcing steel cage with electrical and control system ducts embedded inside the concrete. 
September 27, 1996. The bridge is named. More than 2,200 entries were received. These were narrowed to three finalists that were judged by a committee of seven people. These three were sent to the Minister of Public Works and Government Services Canada, who made the final decision. It's with great honor and privilege that I officially name this historic undertaking the Confederation Bridge. Le Pont de la Confederation. Another sign of the bridge's progress was the start of construction of the Prince Edward Island Toll Plaza. The Toll Plaza will consist of seven lanes with provisions for dedicated truck or car lanes. Mega projects by their nature are notorious for being late and uh, even the supporters of the project were probably somewhat surprised that we uh, uh, fulfilled all those commitments and met all our scheduled targets uh, as we said we would do. Uh, that was the result of a lot of dedication and uh, commitment of a large team towards meeting every milestone that was put in front of them along the way and uh, delivering the project on date certain. On Tuesday, November 19th, 1996, at 11.30 p.m., the last component of the Confederation Bridge was placed. This drop in girders placement marked an important milestone for the project. The provinces of Prince Edward Island and New Brunswick were physically connected. It was a well-deserved celebration. <laughs> six months prior to bridge opening, crews prepared the bridge finishes. The surfacing of the bridge involved crews producing and laying approximately 27,000 tons of technologically advanced polymer modified asphalt cement, which was selected to provide stability in warmer temperatures and to be more flexible in colder temperatures. The bridge deck was cleaned, dried, and preheated by propane burners to 70 degrees prior to the placement of the binder course, a waterproofing membrane, and the wearing course, with a combined thickness of 70 millimeters, and placed at temperatures over 160 degrees. Finishing work also included installation of closed circuit television cameras, traffic signals, emergency alarms, and call boxes at 750 meter intervals along the roadway. Equipment to monitor wind speeds and road conditions were also installed, as well as variable speed limit signs and changeable message boards to inform motorists of bridge conditions, and construction of a seven-lane toll plaza for collection of tolls and gathering of traffic data. These intelligent components form an electronic monitoring system, which is networked to the bridge operations building from the toll plaza. Confederation Bridge carries two lanes of traffic and has a shoulder on each side for emergency stopping. The gentle slopes and curvature of the bridge design and the 1100 millimeter barrier rails combine to make the Confederation Bridge an interesting and comfortable driving experience. The bridge is operational 24 hours a day and is accessible to any vehicle permitted to travel the Trans-Canada Highway. From the toll plaza and operations building, straight crossing officials collect tolls for vehicles and pedestrian shuttle passengers, monitor weather conditions, and control movement of traffic to ensure the safety of all travelers. Finally, during the spring months, when major construction of the bridge was nearing completion, preparations for Bridge Fest 97 began, a three-day festival which would culminate in the official opening of the Confederation Bridge. On the eve of Bridge Fest 97, a picnic for its employees and their families was hosted by Straight Crossing. The celebration began with the unveiling of a monument honoring all the men and women who contributed to the construction of the bridge. This monument displays many of the design features of the bridge, 
and is a tribute to the determination and hard work which made the Confederation Bridge a reality. This is the best crew of people that I've ever, ever been associated with. A great job, a job well done. Thank you very much. However, this gathering of over 2,500 individuals was just the beginning of a festival which would take place over the next three days and include 150,000 people. May Confederation Bridge serve as a vivid reminder of our commitment to Canada and to Confederation. Bridge Fest 97 would be a celebration as big as the Confederation Bridge. The Bridge Race and Bridge Walk were among the first events on opening day and gave participants the once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to cross the Confederation Bridge on foot. The celebration continued with concerts, buskers, vendors, exhibits, and displays. Concerts on the main stage and the rendezvous stage entertained the crowds over the course of the festival with performances by the Rankin family, Bereshwa, and many other performers. The inaugural drive marked the beginning of the official opening of Bridge Fest 97, followed by an afternoon opening ceremony attended by the Honorable Diane Marlowe, Minister of Public Works and Government Services Canada, and the Premiers of PEI, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, as well as other distinguished guests. But the highlight came on Saturday afternoon, May 31st, 1997, when at 5.15 p.m., vehicles drove up to the toll plaza, paid the toll, and were among the first to cross the Confederation Bridge. Bridge Fest 97 was an event of a lifetime, a milestone in Canada's history, and a party which would not be soon forgotten. It celebrated the hard work and achievements of countless men and women, each of whom played an important role in the construction of this 100-year-old dream, the Confederation Bridge. <laughs>